Did you know that the first quantum cybersecurity attack is happening now? Are you aware that it's possible that we might have a full-scale quantum computer in the next few years? Hi, welcome to Thread Track. This episode, we're going to talk about quantum computers, a really hot topic. You've probably heard a lot about them. Now, uh, before we start this conversation, one important thing to know, um, you don't have to be an uh, expert at quantum physics to understand what we're going to talk about. What you do have to know is that quantum computers are coming and they're going to be really fast. And that leads to uh, certain security risks, one of which is what is called a harvest now decrypt later attack. So I'm here today with Bill Trost. How you doing, Bill? Doing quite well. Thank you, Don. How are you? And Brian Miles. How you doing, Brian? Yeah, doing great. Thanks, Don. Okay, so um, let's talk about quantum computers and security, especially. Um, we know quantum computers are coming down the road, um, and we hear talk that they will be able to break all of our current encryption methods. But why is that? Yeah, so let's be a little bit clear. There's a little bit of misnomer about you know what quantum computers can do with encryption, what it can't do, right? So specifically, quantum computers will have a major impact to what they call asymmetric key encryption. Basically, those are keys where you have a public and private key. There's also symmetric key encipherments where you share a common key, and that's for the most part is what's used to share or encrypt data between the two endpoints or between two different users, right? So the biggest impact will be on public key encryption. So when we know some of the algorithms that they've already developed for quantum computers, such as Shor's algorithm, can actually attack asymmetric key encipherments and do a pretty decent job of cracking that, that encryption key and getting at what they call the symmetric key which again is ultimately the key that is used to, to encrypt your data. Um, to the most part, symmetric key and also hashes are more secure than uh, asymmetric key. However, they are, there will be some impact to it from some other algorithms in quantum computing, basically something called Grover's algorithm, and that will have some impact, but not as big of an impact as it does on asymmetric key encipherments. That's the one we're most, most focused on. When we talk about quantum computers, Yes, there are quantum computers in experimental stages right now being developed, but what we're really talking about is what we call a cryptographically relevant quantum computer. So when will those arrive on the scene? The general consensus these days is anywhere from the 2028 to 2032 timeframe. However, as I always point out, there's a non-zero probability that we may see one in the next couple of years. Um, so we have to be focused on that. And then probably the general community thinks um, mostly in the early 2030s and mid 2030s. But again, we don't know exactly when they will arrive on the scene, so we've got to be ready to tackle the problem. And there's another issue as well, too. We always forget about the AI side of things. Um, right now, we see classical attacks by AI or ML algorithms. I think if you blend that along with smaller quantum computers, we might actually see some attacks occurring you know, within the next several years, within the next five years, for sure, in my opinion. Yeah, I would also add that, uh, you know, there's been some recent developments where uh, smaller quantum computers can be essentially networked together. Uh, so uh, one of the problems has been being able to scale a quantum computer to a large enough size to, uh, I guess, meet that <clears throat> cryptographically relevant quantum computer um, state or that full size quantum computer. So being able to network together several smaller ones uh, may get us to the point of having something that impacts us much sooner. Um, also, uh, Qiskit, one of the, I guess, one of the primary uh, programming libraries uh, for quantum computers, they just came out with a new module that uh, it allows you to break a larger quantum circuit into much smaller uh, pieces. Uh, there's also a programming tool uh, from Qiskit uh, that allows you to take a, a quantum circuit that is too big to run on today's quantum computers. It allows, this tool allows you to break it into smaller chunks that can run on the, the smaller quantum computers we have today. And then it stitches all the results back together, um, just like you ran that entire circuit, uh, that entire quantum circuit um, all together on a full scale quantum computer. So some of these things are, maybe we don't have the full size quantum computer that everybody thinks about, but there's certainly some things that can uh, have some impact and, and some things that can bring that thread about uh, much quicker. So it sounds like it's a very more complex situation about when quantum computers arrive. So what does that mean? Does that mean that for now we're safe or are there attacks that could be happening now? Yeah, Don, uh, you know, Harvest Now Decrypt Later or HNDL as we refer to it, uh, 
that's an attack that is happening today. Um, and it's a two part attack. The first part of that is happening today. The second part uh, is going to require a, you know, this full size quantum computer or cryptographically relevant quantum computer to be able to break. But uh, it involves harvesting data, sensitive data today, uh, with the intention of being able to decrypt it at some point in the future. So that's important to know because, you know, we're always told, like I was just watching a video about cybersecurity the other day, and the consensus you always hear is, well, this stays encrypted, so it's safe. You don't have to worry about it, but that may not be the case. So, uh, Bill, tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, again, to Brian's point, right, we have this harvest now decrypt later problem where they are currently, I would say bad actors are currently harvesting data with the anticipation of being able to decrypt this data later on, right? So um, it's important to note, note that not all data has a shelf life. So information such as financial records, health records, intellectual property, government secrets, for example, some of that data has a very, very long shelf life, right? So if a cryptographically relevant computer shows up on the scene capable of cracking that symmetric key or cracking that asymmetric key, I mean, and able to get at that information, they can use that for, again, for nefarious intent. Um, I want to point out, too, that, you know, right now we have new encryption algorithms that are being developed and looked into by NIST. And these are all classically based algorithms. They're all based on what we call mathematic principles, more difficult problems that we believe are resistant to quantum computing. However, there's another side of this coin, and that's something called quantum key distribution or encryption methods based on quantum mechanics or quantum entanglement. And the beauty of this is that we can demonstrate through quantum mechanics or quantum physics that these algorithms are, in fact, way more secure, provably secure over any classical methods. So, again, if it's math based, we can never prove for sure that these uh, encryption algorithms are safe from quantum computers. Whereas if they are quantum based, we can for sure via quantum mechanics demonstrate that these algorithms are provably secure. So these harvest now, decrypt later attacks um, may be happening now. They can be harvesting now. What can we do about it? Yeah, so there's a number of things you can, uh, companies can do. So one of the, I guess, fundamental things that companies should be doing or looking at already if they aren't uh, is developing a cryptographic inventory. That's all about getting the you know, insights and intelligence to make informed decisions about how to address the quantum threat. Um, you know, that's collecting information about you know encrypted files, uh, the coding libraries being used, um, X509 certificates, things like that. Um, so it gives you the information uh, to be able to make the mitigation decisions that need to be made. Yeah, let me just add to that too, Brian. It's an important part of this will be really understanding how we'd be able to use new encryption techniques to protect this data, right? And so there's things called post-quantum cryptography, and those, again, are classical methods, new replacements for current public key encryption. And we need to understand better how those algorithms will work. And again, those are mathematically based, which means that we can never really truly prove they are secure, um, not even against quantum computers, but also against classical computers. And then, as I also mentioned, we have something called quantum key distribution, or one of my favorites is quantum entangled networks, which I believe will be the networks of the future. But anyways, those are all based on quantum mechanical techniques, in which case we can prove they are secure, right? So it's really important to understand the difference between these new classical encryption algorithms as well as those based on quantum mechanics. And again, quantum key distribution is the one that is leading the pack right now. And then the other side of the coin is we really want to develop a better, well, a defense in depth strategy is always the best, right? Don't rely on exactly or strictly one type of encryption algorithm. For example, even with these new classical algorithms, we still have this harvest now decrypt later problem. And what do I mean by that? I mean, if we develop one of these new classical based encryption algorithms, right, and we use, and we start using that to protect our data, who's to say 10 years down the road that that algorithm doesn't get cracked either by a classical computer or a quantum computer? So really, any data that was protected by that method, right, is still subject be is still subject being cracked, you know, by somebody with uh, nefarious intent. So again, if we start looking at those based on quantum techniques, that's forward. Per, that's perfect forward secrecy, meaning that if it's if it's encrypted today, you can't decrypt it in the future, no matter what. So, and then the other side of the coin is we want to move to a zero trust architecture. I know that's in the cybersecurity realm these days, anyways. But we really need to be focused on that moving forward. We can't trust that any particular assets being protected by any type of encryption algorithm right now. So it's really important to just take this extra step and say already assume that the quantum computer has compromised your network or has compromised a computer, right? So we need to move more towards a zero trust uh, architecture. 
Okay, we've talked about how we can protect ourselves now, but what about when cryptographically relevant quantum computers arrive on the scene? How will we be able to protect our data then? So there's some things that can be done at that point. Uh, a couple things, at least I want to stress, uh, it is really important um, to note <laughs> the best uh, opportunity we had to protect against quantum computers and the, against the CRQC is to be prepared to enter a state of what we call quantum readiness. Um, so, and that's about being prepared now, even though the threat's not here yet. So all these things take time to implement. So I just need to stress, it's really important to get started sooner versus later on all of these. Uh, and it's also worth noting that I would say a, a nation state is, is, it's probably likely that a nation state will develop a quantum computer or cryptographically relevant quantum computer first. And we may not even know about it for some period of time. So, uh, you know, that just adds more uncertainty to the date that we're going to have one of these computers um, threatening our cryptography. Uh, you know, NIST has been pretty heavily involved in post quantum cryptography and getting the, those uh, standards defined. Uh, those are set to be published in 2024. So, um, that's a good step forward. You know, as Bill mentioned earlier, as long as algorithms are based on math, we are never 100% sure that, you know, they're not going to be broken at some point in the future. So, you know, that's PQC is great, but we still kind of have to keep it in mind that at some point down the road that might be broken as well. Uh, you know, Harvest Now Decrypt Later, as long as there's that potential, Harvest Now Decrypt Later continues being a problem even after CRQC emerges. A few times we've used the word crypto agility. Uh... What does that mean? Yeah, so crypto agility is, you know, that's the end game. That's where we want to get to uh, in our quantum security preparations. For the most part, it involves uh, offboarding your cryptography, uh, putting it in a centralized place that you can use automation to change out uh, an algorithm quickly on, you know, short notice um, without having to redeploy all your applications, without having to touch every application and, you know, run it through the pipeline and get it redeployed into production. Um, so that's ultimately what we want to get to, and that's that's crypto agility. It's that having that agility to change out your algorithm, so you know down the road, uh, kind of back to what Bill had said and what I stated a minute ago. Uh, PQC algorithms uh, based on math might be broken at some point in the future. We just don't know exactly uh, how how long standing they're going to be. So we need to prepare, and crypto agility is another way to prepare. So for security professionals, for enterprises out there, what should they be doing now? What tips can we give folks about what they should be doing now to get quantum ready? So that is a great question. Um, so we have a little bit of time yet, as we discussed earlier. Um, really, the reality of it is we, we could potentially see a, a CRQC in the next few years, unlikely, probably more towards the end of this decade. So there are things we can do right now, and Brian kind of touched upon a couple of these. But the biggest thing that I think anybody can do right now, especially if you're in industry, is form at least a small team that follows what's happening in this space, right? Generate, generate awareness over this, uh, develop a quantum readiness team as we've done here at at and I mean, we're heavily focused on what's happening in this space. Um, as Brian touched on, you want to gather information, build intelligence, if you will, on your, your cryptographic assets, right? Do a cryptographic inventory and so forth. Another important piece that we haven't talked about is conducting quantitative risk assessments. And what I mean by that is you want to understand exactly how your, your cryptographic assets, if you will, are at risk due to quantum computing, right? And potentially uh, what that loss could look like or what that risk is um, on those assets. And you want to do it quantitatively from the perspective of understanding what is the dollar amount. And one thing we do here is we look at the risk to a given asset. Uh, we look at the increased impact from quantum computers, right? We take into consideration there are different uh, types of mitigation technologies. And what I mean by that, again, the new post-quantum encryption algorithms, Brian touched on digital QKD is out there right now. QKD devices are coming. And again, in the future, quantum entangled networks. Um, so we want to understand, you know, exactly how those increase the security, if you will, of those assets, right? And again, this is something that's going to change over, over time. So again, Brian touched on the crypto agility piece where we want to be able to move from one type of encryption algorithm to another type of encryption algorithm as quickly as possible. And I think probably one of the biggest things you can do right now is develop a mitigation strategy plan. Again, I'm proud here at AT&T to say that's exactly what we're doing, right? We want to strategize on how we can look at the impact from quantum, but also how do we deal with that, that impact from quantum computing, right? 
what's the process for protecting those assets? And then the other thing we we do, and I think uh, most people can do this, is follow work being done by government agencies such as NIST. NIST is responsible for for um, fleshing out new encryption algorithms, right? Standardizing those encryption algorithms and formulating a plan that 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 people can move towards post quantum encryption, as we call it. Uh, of course, uh, NSA is heavily involved with this, and there's also agencies or government bodies overseas that are heavily focused on this on this problem. Um, as well. So it's a, it's a worldwide problem. Yeah, it's also very important to follow what's happening um, from the national security perspective, follow the national strategy. We've seen the implementation of the Quantum Initiative Act back in 2018, and we've seen several security memorandums issued this year. Uh, most of government agencies, if not all, are moving towards at least developing a plan to move to quantum safe um, cryptography, if you will. So I think it's important to pay attention to what they're doing in that space and to the extent that you can implement some of the work that the government's done in that space. And those would be my top tips. Yeah, there's one other item that we didn't really touch on that I think is important to note, uh, supply chain. Most companies use a lot of vendor products and vendor solutions for various parts of their business. Uh, so it's very important to just make sure and reach out and discuss your their quantum readiness and start looking at what your vendors and suppliers are doing to prepare for quantum. Yeah, actually, let me just say too, at t is taking a, a big step forward and I think is a, a big contributor to the community, right? We participate in a lot of different standard bodies. We're members of the Quantum Economic Development Consortium. So here at at t we're actually driving what's happening in this space. We're becoming leaders in the space and helping people understand what this problem is, educating people, uh, comprehending what technologies are available that can mitigate the risk from quantum computing. And we're involved in all these different facets of quantum computing and how we protect sure. not only at t but our customers, as well as a national security issue, right? This is this is the global issue, matter of fact, and it takes all of us, or it's gonna take all of us, if you will, to, to mitigate the risk from, from quantum computing. Okay, well, thank you for all that great insight. You know, um, there's a lot of opportunities and positive aspects of quantum technology. And I'm sure with all the expertise um, of cyber professionals, uh, this is a risk and a challenge that will be solved in the future. And we're gonna be hearing a lot more about just some of the tremendous uh, opportunities that uh, quantum technology can provide. So thank you, Bill, and thank you, Brian, for being on Threat Track, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Thanks Don. Don.